All right. Well, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. I hope y'all are having a great day today. Uh, just to sort of remind everyone, we're not really meeting in person today, um, but you know, I sort of opened it up. We're in the regular classroom anyway. I figure maybe a few people will, you know, have something they have to go to. So, welcome to attend in person. Welcome to watch it live. Welcome to watch a recording. Uh, of course, if you're watching this, you probably figured that out. So. Uh, today's all about wireless networking, specifically talking about you know the different standards associated with it. Um, the book doesn't do a great job talking about more modern standards. I would really like to see them uh, be a little bit more up to date with things, but that's okay. In the lecture, I'll make sure that we're all updated on all the new wireless changes because it's been a lot in the past couple of years. Um, Wi-Fi 6, um, using Wi-Fi on the 6 gigahertz spectrum, lots of cool changes we'll talk about. Uh, wireless networking components, go through that very briefly. Should be pretty self-explanatory to, you know, talk about what's making up a wireless network, talk about some of the different uh, types of wireless network, go over just a little bit with site survey, some tips and various techniques to do that. And of course, we'll wrap up talking just a little bit about wireless security. Um, the next few chapters go a lot more in depth than wireless security, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that either. Okay, so that's the basics of wireless networking. Uh, as we know, of course, it's going to be using a local area network over a wireless connection. So another term for this could be wireless fidelity. That's what Wi-Fi stands for, of course. And unlike a lot of cable media, this is considered to be a broadcast medium. So it's all about using RF signals. You have different antenna. And, you know, as we know from a broadcast medium, we don't really determine which device receives which packet. So it's going to be operating almost like a hub, um, not really a hub. Uh, I would really not like that terminology very much. But in practicality, that's what's basically happening here. So just kind of make sure everyone's on the same page with this. Uh, there's some different standards to sort of uh, know and understand. I'm not going to go too much in depth on this, but just understand the basics. Of course, you have IEEE. Uh, they're going to be the ones responsible for all the IEEE 802 standards. So that's pretty much everything to do with networking. It's not just 802.11. Of course, we have stuff like 802.3 AF, and I think it's AT as well, where it's talking about the PoE standards. Uh, we have 802.1X, talking about the encryption standards. Um, lots of different standards associated with networking. So, you know, certainly some FCC is important in the United States because they're the ones who determine what the wireless networks can use in terms of their spectrum. So we'll talk about that in a couple slides. ES or ETSI, it's a European thing, unless you're going to be in Europe, there's really no reason to worry about that one. Uh, Wi-Fi Alliance, that's going to really do a lot of stuff with certifying uh, various Wi-Fi hardware. Just give us some basic sort of you know, stuff with that. And then WLAN Association, uh, that's not really one you'll need to worry too much with either. The main things to know are IEEE and the FCC. Now, again, if you want to go to Europe, you obviously need to know others, but, you know, we're not in Europe. We're in the United States. So all we need to worry about is the United States. Okay. So there's really three different sorts of uh, spectrum that Wi-Fi is allowed to use. So 2.4 gigahertz, that's what's most commonly used for a lot of older devices in particular. Uh, but even some newer devices still don't support 5 gigahertz. Uh, but, you know, most good new devices should certainly support both. Um, and then, of course, we have 5 gigahertz, and also we have 6 gigahertz. So 6 gigahertz is very new. Um, very few devices support it, but, in, you know, as we move along, certainly more and more will support it. Now, if you look in the book, you'll notice that it had N listed as a draft. I mean, that image hadn't been updated since, like, 2007. So I thought that was kind of goofy. Uh, but just understand that when Wi-Fi was first released, there were A and B. Um, B technically came to market first. They were both sort of certified at around the same time. B used 2.4 gigahertz, had a very slow speed of 11 megabits a second. Um, that's not a very fast speed for today, but, you know, 1999 wasn't terrible. Um, you know, there was still a lot of 10, 100 connections. You even had some just 10 connections. So, you know, B wasn't really that bad back then. Now, in present day, it'd be horrible. Okay. But we're not in, you know, 
20 years ago. So A came to market a little bit later, used 5 megahertz, or 5 gigahertz, I mean, for the frequency. And, you know, sort of building off that frequency is able to get more speed. It's able to have better support. We'll talk about the differences between 2.4 and 5 in a couple slides here. Just understand it's able to sort of have better performance overall for most cases. Um, there are certain cases where 2.4 gigahertz will do better than 5 gigahertz. Very few and far between, though. Um, the main one it's going to do better in is if you wanted to have a very small number of access points for a very large space. 2.4 is technically better for that. It's also better for going through stuff like walls, which may sound good until you think about, do you always want the signal to go through a wall? And in a corporate environment, and even in a residential environment, you probably don't want it to go through very many walls, especially not exterior walls. Um, now, I would argue that if you ever wanted to have an exterior network, use an exterior access point. You're gonna get a lot better performance anyway, and then you're not running into stuff like interference as much. So we'll talk about that. Uh, of course, then we had G come out in around 2003, really come into the market more like 2004, 2005. Um, it's also 2.4 gigahertz, but it was able to match the speed of A. So you know, some advantages there. It has some new technologies. We'll talk about what it introduced. Uh, just understand that it sort of matched that speed, but on 2.4 gigahertz. Um, it's also, of course, going to be backwards compatible with B. And of course, you had N release, 2009. It was technically released a little before that, actually. Um, they had a draft version that was basically the same as release. So it wasn't uncommon to have, from the period about 2006 to about 2009, to have a device that supported N, even though it wasn't officially released. Uh, there were a lot of reasons why it was pushed a little bit early. Uh, the main one was speed, but also supporting 5 gigahertz. Um, don't worry about the 600 megabits per second. That's a theoretical speed that's also uh, dependent upon having more than one set of antenna. Uh, so we're not going to assume 600 megabits per second on N. That's really not a fair assumption in my opinion. Um, it's going to be using at least uh, four antenna to achieve that speed. I would say that a more practical speed, you may realize, would probably be 300 megabits per second on N, but hey, you know, your mileage may vary with anything in networking, of course, especially wireless, because there's so many unknown variables. You know, if we had a perfect test chamber, we could probably achieve any of these theoretical speeds, but life is not a perfect test chamber. So with that in mind, just understand that it came out. We'll talk about some of the new technologies that introduced in a little bit. Of course, you have AC. Uh, it's a standard that at this point is pretty much ubiquitous on any device from the past five years, or maybe even six or seven. Uh, just like N, it's on 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. So uh, it has some advantages, though, stuff like uh, beam-forming signals. Uh, it's certainly an advantage. It's faster, uh, as you would expect. You know, theoretical speed of 1.3 gigabits per second, pretty fast. And then, of course, we have... Uh, Wi-Fi 6, also known as 802.11ax. And basically, this is a more modern standard. It's latest and greatest, although not really technically, because there is another version of Wi-Fi 6 that supports 6 gigahertz. Uh, so that has some advantages. But you know, for the most part, just understand that if you see Wi-Fi 6, it's going to be the latest. Um, theoretical speeds up to about 10 gigabits per second. Uh, I would make an argument you're probably not going to see that for another couple of years, but hey, uh, maybe you will. Uh, I just think it's unlikely with the current technology we have, current devices that are on. You're probably going to see a couple gigabits per second, though. So that's a very beneficial thing, and it's kind of funny to me to look at a lot of these uh, Wi-Fi 6 access points. You look at what ports they have on it. Um, unless you're buying a relatively high-end enterprise router, or I wouldn't say enterprise router, enterprise access point, it probably only has a gigabit per second uh, NIC on it. So all the different ports are all going to be gigabit. Now, you can communicate with the access point very quickly, but you know, going from the access point to whatever you're actually connecting to, it's still going to be gigabit per second. So I find that kind of funny. Um, of course, a lot of the sort of mid-range enterprise access points, like the ones from Ubiquity, they have a 2.4. 5 gigabit per second uh, uplink, so still nowhere near the theoretical speed of 
the actual wireless connection. But you're not going to achieve the theoretical speed anyway. Um, you know, I don't know of any access point where one device connected to it is going to get 12 gigabits per second. Now, with the next standard, probably will be able to do that. But with the current standards, it's just not really feasible. Um, so, yeah, there's some other stuff here. Just understand we're talking about the, um, the frequencies. Of course, we have sonar. It's going to be very uh, low frequency. X-rays, that's obviously going to be very high frequencies. Um, invisible light. Of course, we're not in the visible light spectrum when we're talking about these different uh, signals. We're sort of in between right here. So we're a little bit above cellular and a little bit below visible light. Okay? Because obviously you can't see Wi-Fi. I don't think anyone's going to make that argument. Uh, at least not with the naked eye. 900 megahertz isn't really used for Wi-Fi. It's used for various IoT standards. Um, I believe Z-Wave is 900 megahertz. I think Zigbee is 2.4. Uh, don't quote me on that, though. Um, but I believe that's the case. So just kind of understand that we're talking typically 2.4 gigahertz to 5 gigahertz. So a little bit about 2.4 gigahertz. In the United States, it's a very crowded uh, frequency. Many different things use it. For example, uh, decked wireless phones. Uh, if you have a home phone system that's wireless, most likely using 2.4 gigahertz. Um, there's several other things as well. Uh, Bluetooth, for example, very commonly uses 2.4 gigahertz. So basically the FCC set aside a total of 14 channels for using uh, Wi-Fi on the uh, 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. And only three of those do not have any overlap. So you want to make sure you're using 1, 6, or 11. And pretty much every... Uh, you know, commercially available product will only go to one of these three frequencies in the United States. Now, in other countries, they have more than that, but in the United States, those are the three that we use. So, in general, a 2.4 gigahertz signal is going to be slower than a 5 gigahertz or a 6 gigahertz signal. But, depends upon many, many factors. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's always going to be slower, but certainly when we're talking about using a C or a six or a uh, Wi-Fi six, you know, you're gonna want to be using five gigahertz, or if you can with Wi-Fi six, use six gigahertz if possible. Um, but you know, 2.4 gigahertz, like I said, it passes through walls a lot better. So you know, anytime you're going through any sort of thick material, um, you know, this 2.4 gigahertz is gonna pass through it a lot better. That's both good and bad. When you only have three channels that overlap. Um, you know, imagine you're in an apartment complex, okay? Every apartment has their own router and access point. So, you know, if you're using Wi-Fi uh, on the 5 gigahertz spectrum, you're pretty unlikely to come across more than a handful of access points on that. Okay, but let's say that you're using 2.4 gigahertz, you know? I'd encourage you, if you use Android, uh, you know, when you go home or if you're already at home, download a Wi-Fi analyzer app. Unfortunately, I don't think that exists on iOS. Um, due to some limitations Apple placed on what apps they allow. Just take a look at it. See what channels people are using. Um, Brown, do you use Android or do you use iOS? Okay. Do you have the Wi-Fi analyzer app? Recommend you try it out. You do it right now if you want. You should see a bunch of stuff on 1, 6, and 11. Because uh, basically every access point, you know, it's on the 2.4. And you can also check out 5 gigahertz as well. Um, assuming your phone supports it. Um, so yeah, just make sure that you sort of understand that, that three channels and the signal for the most part is going to be very uh, broad in terms of where it's able to go. Okay, that contrasts pretty heavily with 5 gigahertz. So 5 gigahertz is something where there's not going to be very many overlapping channels. There's going to be a lot more non-overlapping channels, I should say. So we have all these different channels we could use. And... That's going to allow it to be a lot faster. Well, that's not the only reason it's faster. It's just the signal itself is going to be faster. But, like I say, this big caveat, it depends upon you know, the specifics of the connection, how many devices are on the access point, other interference it may have. There's very little interference on the 5 gigahertz spectrum. Uh, somewhere in the middle around here, there are some reserved channels as well. But we don't have to worry too much about that. Um, so there's going to be a lot less passage through walls which, like I say, is good and bad. 
if you're just going for basic coverage of an enterprise and you have a really low budget, this may be bad. But in almost every other case, you know, access points aren't going to be but a couple hundred bucks. Okay, uh, if you're buying something like a Ubiquity or a Micropic, you can get them for like under a hundred bucks. Uh, if you're buying, you know, Cisco, Meraki, uh, Aruba, some of those brands. You're paying a couple hundred bucks, and in some cases, you may be paying thousands of dollars per access point. That's pretty rare, though. Um, that's going to be a really high end access point. It's going to be quite powerful and lots of good stuff. So, you know, this is kind of what it looks like. You have 1, 6, and 11 with 2.4 gigahertz. You got all these guys with 5 gigahertz. So, not only are you less likely to have the, um, to have the signal sort of you know reach because it doesn't pass through walls as well even if it did there's so many other channels available that don't overlap you know it's almost a non-issue compared to 2.4 gig like i say um you know on my setup at home i use a ubiquity network and it's uh got a unify ap and i have an edge router x and if i sign on to the controller for the unify ap it'll show me the 2.4 gigahertz and it'll show me the 5 gigahertz and it'll be like 99% available in 5 gigahertz. And I don't know about here. I haven't actually signed on. haven't had any problems or any need to. Um, now that I'm sort of a little bit spaced out, you know, have a house instead of an apartment. But back when I was a PhD student, I had an apartment. I'd sign on to it. The 2.4 gigahertz spectrum would be like 24% uh, you know, free. Whereas the 5 gigahertz spectrum would be 99% free. So I encourage you to do that on you know, Wi-Fi analyzer, or if you have an enterprise access point, take a look at it, you know, see it. It's not a requirement, but I think it'll be interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna go through some different wireless technologies that were introduced by each standard. Now obviously, if uh, wireless technology were introduced in one standard, more than likely it's present in all subsequent standards. So the first one, of course, being uh, collision avoidance. Uh, just make sure you understand that. We talked about it in previous chapters. I'm not going to go in depth right here, but just understand it's to avoid collision. Because like I said, the access point is going to send the signal out to everybody. Okay? So that's where we have this process. Request to send, confirm to send, send the data, send the acknowledgement it was received. Um, this process has a fair bit of overhead. It's not necessarily going to be the most ideal process ever. Uh, like I said, it's introduced in B. That's sort of B's main contribution. But that's a very important contribution. Without it, wireless technology as we know it, uh, at least in terms of 802.11, transmission would not be a usable experience. And I think that it's come a long way in making sure that it's a usable experience. Dynamic frequency selection. Um, depending upon where you lie on whether H is actually a standard or not, um, you know, I would make an argument it's not really a standard that anyone ever used. It's really implemented into A. So I would argue it's either H or A, depending on what you think about it. It's a very important one as well. Dynamic frequency selection. Okay, because when you have a limited number of frequencies, you don't want to hard program in, we're always going to be on one. We're always going to be on six. We're always going to be on 11. Because what if other access points are broadcasting a very strong six channel? What are you going to do? If it's hard coded in, you don't have very many options. Okay. So you, met, you automatically select the best algorithm depending upon uh, sort of the frequencies available. And like I said, you can take a look at this on an enterprise access point if you happen to have an enterprise home network. Um, and if you don't have one, you know, it's only, you could probably get one for about 150 bucks, not too bad. Take a look at it. It's going to be really interesting to see how it selects it. And I think it's pretty cool. Um, some advanced home router access point combos may support it as well. I don't know too much about them. Um, transmit power control, like I said, it's another thing introduced in H or A, depending on what your opinion is on that. And basically this is going to allow us to, from the radio, sort of determine how much power we apply to it. So this is more of an issue on uh, 2.4 gigahertz, uh, because it could be that we want to reduce the power applied so that the signal doesn't bleed out as much. Uh, that's going to be very beneficial if we're wanting to have a high density area. So if we didn't have that, we've got 2.4 gigahertz has three available channels. 
free non-overlapping channels. If we're not doing this, then we're going to have some very big issues when it comes to, you know, having all of those not be overlapping each other. Um, most of the time, you can do this dynamically as well. You don't have to manually apply this, although there could be some cases where you want to manually apply it. Um, you know, you could make an argument you use this for security. I think that's a really silly argument to make, but you could make that argument. Um, such that if you have a property and you don't want the wireless signal to extend beyond the property, well, you really only have one option. Well, a couple options. One feasible option. Okay, the feasible option is to adjust how much power you're applying to the radios. Now, the less feasible options, do some crazy stuff like enclose the property with a lead, uh, like put lead in the walls. Okay, because obviously lead's going to stop a wireless signal. Um, however, what's the problem with that? It's costly. Um, you know, lead's not a great thing to work with. Heavy metals, you know, you typically want to avoid uh, certainly ingestion of them. You want to keep them off of your skin as much as possible. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just an impractical solution. Why not just adjust the power? That's a much easier way to solve things. Okay, so uh, just kind of shifting gears a little bit. Uh, multiple input, multiple output. It's commonly referred to as MIMO. It's going to be one of the main things that was introduced with the N standard. And that's really what I was saying about, you know, 600 megabits per second is assuming we have multiple antenna. If we just have two antenna on a uh, in network, it's not going to be getting 600 megabits per second. So really, once you move to in and beyond, the theoretical speeds become highly dependent not only upon the you know, distance, location, all that stuff, it also depends upon the access point itself. Uh, so basically, as you would imagine, you have multiple antenna, it's going to be faster. Okay? You have fewer antenna, it's going to be slower. And it's also going to allow us to support more devices with more antenna. So MIMO is a good thing. Okay, we got block acknowledgement. This is also introduced in N. And basically, instead of having each frame have an acknowledge, we're doing it multiple frames with the same acknowledge. So it's going to save a little bit of overhead. It's going to allow us to go a little bit faster in practice. And this is an important one. Because if we didn't have this, you know, the theoretical speed is not the speed of downloading. It's the speed of the connection itself. So we have a limited amount of bandwidth on that entire connection. So that's why it's important to understand that. Okay, wireless network components, these are pretty basic. Uh, we have an access point. It's going to be what allows us to communicate with all the different devices. Um, you know, in an enterprise setting, you're probably going to have an access point that has PoE port, and that's probably going to be its only port. Uh, maybe there's another port as well for daisy chaining stuff. For the most part, though, you're going to have one port on your access point. Now, if you're buying some, com uh, some not commercial, if you're buying some, you know, residential quality um, router access point combo, as you know most home people do, then it's probably going to have a switch built in as well. So it may have a port that connects to whatever the modem is, if you have a modem, or whatever your uplink is to your ISP going to have one port for that. Probably if you're buying a home device, it's going to have a switch with four other ports on it as well. It's just doing everything in one device. Um, personally, I don't like that approach, but hey, I'm one person. Uh, if you're in an enterprise environment, you never want to use some you know, commercial stuff like that. You always want to use enterprise-grade stuff. Uh, a lot of reasons that's easier to manage. It's going to have much better performance, better reliability. Um, lots of big advantages. Wireless NIC, just like a uh, sort of a hardwired NIC, obviously it's going to have at least two antenna on it. It's going to allow us to communicate with the access point and possibly other devices. Uh, wireless antennas, obviously going to be used to send and receive. I don't think that needs too much explaining. We have omnidirectional, point to multipoint. That's going to be what your access point is going to have on it, most likely. It's also going to be what your devices are going to have on it. Because with directional, for point-to-point -point communication, okay, the whole purpose, uh, the main purpose of a wireless network is to allow people to move around and still stay connected. Okay, so if you have a directional antenna, it's going to be very difficult to do that. Not impossible, um, you know, but very difficult. So 
Uh, that's going to be used for things like wireless bridges. If you ever wanted to put one of those in, which I would recommend against, just run a cable, I always say. But, you know, maybe you can't run a cable for whatever reason. You could use a wireless bridge. Um, also, things like a microwave, where you have, you know, point to point connection. You, know, you could certainly do that. And those aren't very expensive nowadays. The expensive part, of course, is a tower. Because for the most part, you know, it doesn't make sense if you had two buildings. Okay, so we got building A over here. We have building B over here. If this distance is like 100 yards, then why not just run a cable either underground or maybe even, you know, above ground? You know, for 100 yards, that's not very expensive to do. Okay, where it gets expensive is if this is, say, 10,000 yards. Okay, now this is expensive. If the buildings are tall enough, all you got to do, go up to the high points on the building, put your little microwave up here, make sure that they have line of sight, and boom, that's a pretty affordable connection, isn't it? Okay, but that's assuming that the buildings are that far apart. So that's pretty much the only time you'll really use directional. Okay, so ad hoc, not something you're likely to use, but you may use it if you had two devices that wanted to communicate directly. Um, I think, you know, a common example of this in modern day is going to be something like NFC. Okay, so if you have an NFC connection on your phone, that's an ad hoc connection. It's not going through a server. It's going from one phone to another. Okay, so that's a common example of it. It's not really, I mean, it is wireless, but it's not, it's not 802.11, no, that's for sure. So basically, we have different devices. Their NICs are communicating, which, as we know, if they have a radio, they certainly can. Because if you have a wireless device, can it send packets? Yeah. Therefore, it can transmit packets. Okay, it doesn't have to transmit it to another, to an access point. It could transmit it directly to another device. Um, it's what's referred to as an independent basic service set. Okay, the independent part is because there's no access point. Okay, this is the Wild West. In the Wild West, there are no corporate rules saying what can and cannot happen just two or more devices communicating with each other. So there is no access point, there are no corporate policies applied to an ad hoc network. Does that make sense? Okay. So more likely, you'll see infrastructure mode basic service set. Okay, the infrastructure comes in from the access point. Okay, so it's going to be provided by the access point. That's a basic service area. You should call that the range. Uh, it's not technically the range, but it's basically the range. Okay, so you have your big uh, coverage area. Typically, it's going to be a radius of about 300 feet. So coincidentally, that's pretty similar to the range of a broadcast or a cable media. It's uh, kind of funny. But um, basically, all communication on a infrastructure mode, DSS, goes through the access point. There is no one device communicating directly to another device. It must go through the access point. And of course, if we think about this, the SSID is the collision domain, okay, on the access point, I should say. So let's say, for instance, we have an uh, enterprise access point, and we have one that supports up to eight SSIDs. Now, obviously, each SSID we add is going to remove a little bit of performance because it has to broadcast them all, and if it's broadcasting eight things, then they're going to be a little bit slower than broadcasting one thing. So yeah, and that's going to depend also upon the antenna configuration. If it's like a 4x4 MIMO, okay, you really wouldn't realistically want to go beyond four SSIDs. So that's when you really have performance tank is after that. If it's a 2x2 two two MIMO, and by the way, this is uh, excluding anything for uh, maintenance purposes. So a lot of times you'll see a 3x3, three three, but it'll be acting like a 2x2. Two Okay, because he reserves one set of antenna for, you know, maintenance and, you know, not just maintenance, uh, configuration, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, just because it's a whatever doesn't mean it has all those available for, you know, broadcast on the 802.11 uh, spectrum. Okay. So, that's the SSID. Of course, we also have the idea of an extended service set. 
And this mostly happens automatically in modern devices, where basically if you have two different access points that are on this, that have the same SSID between them, and assuming they're also on the same network, obviously, um, it doesn't really say that in the book, but that is a requirement, of course. Uh, they're on different channels. That's a big important requirement. That should happen automatically. Um, you're unlikely to see two access points bordering each other without being on different channels. But basically what that's saying is you have to have at least 10% overlap between the two of them in terms of coverage area. And it's going to allow a seamless transfer. So that was introduced, I think it was in Wi-Fi 802.11G, but I'm not sure. It might have been it. Either way, this is a very beneficial thing because, you know, if you're walking down the street, or let's say you're walking down the hallway of a corporate environment, do you want to be disconnecting and reconnecting all the time? I would hope you don't, okay? If you do want to, that's fine, but you're just making a worse experience for yourself. So I don't know why you would. So, also I want to talk about wireless controllers. The book doesn't do a great job here. Um, it only talks about standalone and hardware. Whereas I make the argument that's not the only two. Okay? So wireless controller is simply going to be what applies the policies to the access points. So, you know, like I say, on a home, you know, uh, router, uh, access point combo, it's likely that the controller is also built into it. However, on corporate uh, or enterprise access points, uh, most of the time, they're just going to be a pretty dumb device by themselves. Um, you have to have some device that's going to push the policies out to them. And that can be done on the access point itself. So in a standalone system, the access point is running the full operating system. It has all the full configuration. You basically uh, go to the access point, push the configuration to it directly. Um, that's going to be like an older way to do things. A somewhat newer way to do things, but still probably 10 years out of date in most cases, is a hardware. Uh, wireless controller, okay? So you may go to a enterprise network, and I don't know if the network guys showed you all these, uh, but basically if they have a hardware controller, you know, like a little rack mounted thing. And basically you sign onto that, and it's gonna have a connection to all the access points. So it can reach them all, and it's gonna be able to push them firmware, it's gonna be able to push them configurations, anything it needs. Uh, now, like I said, that's a hardware way to do things. In more modern time, we're more likely to see either software-based or cloud-based. Basically, they have the same principles as a hardware controller, except there is no physical hardware dedicated to it. So for example, if you had a software wireless controller, you could spin up a VM, install it in the VM, and do everything you would from a hardware controller, only you're doing it from the software on the VM. So. It's a more efficient way to do things because, you know, is it cheaper to have a $1,500 wireless controller or is it cheaper to devote just a tiny little bit of resources to a VM? Obviously the VM. Okay, last we've got cloud. Uh, so cloud is going to be something most likely is not hosted by the company. Most likely it's hosted by the vendor. And it's going to be a wireless controller that's going to connect all the virtual, or not the virtual access points, the, the access points, and it's going to have that connection there. Okay? Like I said, you got thin and you got thick. Okay? Just like in computing, we have thin clients, uh, chubby clients, and fat clients. Those are technical terms. A uh, thin client, of course, has very little installed on it locally, whereas a fat client has everything installed on it locally. And a chubby client is somewhere in between. Okay? So thin and thick. So a thin access point is one that does not have the operating system installed on it. It basically gets that from the controller. So it's going to have not only the configurations, but pretty much everything off of the device. And even in 2021, you can buy access points with only a couple megabytes of RAM. And that's because they're thin access points. They don't need a lot of RAM. They don't need a lot of one-board storage. They don't need NVRAM. Okay? Thick access points put everything on the device. So if your controller goes down, and you have thin access points, what does that mean for your wireless network? It means it's toast. Okay? You have thick access points, your wireless controller goes down, what does that mean for your wireless network? It means it's more difficult to configure them. Okay? So thick and thin, make up your mind about what you prefer. Um, 
you know, I think that it really depends on many things. Depends on your environment, mostly. Um, and that's pretty much the biggest thing. Environment and budget. Makes sense? Because, let's face it, if you go to a place and you're starting off, do you want to tell them, hey guys, let's convert everything to Meraki. I like Meraki. You don't have that, you don't you really have that ability to do that. I mean, you can certainly say to your boss, I think we should transition to Meraki for these reasons. But your boss is going to say, well, we already have this existing solution that works fine. Why on earth would we change? Not to mention, I don't want to pay Meraki's support contract. Okay? Just make sure you understand that. Okay, signal degradation. Uh, pretty straightforward here. Uh, as we know, wireless signals, you know, as we move further away from the access point, it's going to have more distance. So the strength of the signal is going to be measured in dBm. Uh, anything 70 and up is probably not going to be very usable. It's not going to be a great experience. Anything, you know, 70 and below is probably going to work just fine. Um, so obviously distance, you know, how far away. Most access points will support about three or 400. Let me rephrase that. Most enterprise access points can theoretically support three or 400 feet, um, whereas anything beyond that, probably unlikely to be able to establish a connection. Now, having said that, um, there are, of course, very powerful access points that can sustain connections for like 1,500 feet. Okay. Those are going to be thousands of dollars. They're probably, for pretty much anything, not going to be what you want to use. But yes, they do technically exist. Physical barriers, obviously, anything physical. Um, even something like a piece of paper could degrade your signal. Not by much, because you know, paper is not very thick, doesn't really have a lot of mass to it or anything. Now, contrast, like if you had a sheet of lead, you put wrapped your device in lead, do you think you get a connection at all? Unless it's extremely thin lead, yeah, you're not going to get very much of a connection. I don't even know if you can make lead that. I've always seen lead, uh, lead be like a millimeter thick or so. So, yeah, maybe you can make it really thin, like aluminum foil. I don't know. But, yeah, anything physical. So, a wall. Okay, you got a standard sheetrock wall, no insulation. You know, even 5 gigahertz can go through that a couple times. But when you start getting into insulated walls, and you start getting into, like, your sheathing, your plywood, and sheetrock, that's when it becomes a lot more difficult to pass a signal through it. Again, it's both good and bad. Depends on what you're wanting to cover. Depends on what you're wanting to not have bleed into your building. Um, protocols being used. Obviously, if you're using an older protocol, you're going to have less signal. That's pretty self-explanatory. Newer protocol is going to be a little bit more efficient, able to pass signal a lot better. And then interference. Okay, doesn't this have to be interference from other access points? Be interference from anything on that spectrum. So, for example, I believe, and I'm, don't quote me on this, I believe either radar or sonar or something is on the 5 gigahertz spectrum. Maybe it's even the, uh, what's that, what stuff they use for the weather, the Doppler stuff? I don't know. Something else is on 5 gigahertz. That could technically cause interference. Unlikely to cause an issue because there's so many channels available, but it could technically. Um, 2.4 gigahertz, you're guaranteed to have interference. Um, it's kind of amazing to me that 2.4 gigahertz works at all. Um, just given, you know, especially like in a really congested environment, like I was describing my previous apartment complex. Um, it wasn't even really that, you know, crazy of like, you know, putting 100 people in a building. This was like eight people in a building. It was still getting a ton of signals from all around it. Um, so it's kind of, like I said, try it out. You know, when you go home, it's not a requirement, but I think you'd enjoy it. Um, maybe you wouldn't. Okay, so site survey. So let's say that when you get your first job, one of the first things you're supposed to do is upgrade the wireless network. So they have an existing wireless network. It doesn't meet their needs. So information gathering, start off with the scope of the network. Okay, interview the different people involved, all the different stakeholders. See what devices they're using. See what they're using those devices for. Uh, see what applications, you know, that's applications I wouldn't really say are that important. See what types of applications, though. If they're doing a bunch of uh, web streaming, obviously it's going to be a lot different than if they're doing Wikipedia reading. Okay. Security, uh, that's going to be basically for any enterprise setting, you're going to be using 802.1x with a radius server. So, you know, sure, get information about their security, but you're going to be doing the same thing pretty much no matter what. Okay. Coverage area, how much area does it need to cover? What does that area look like? 
what are the building materials? You know, are for example, let's say you're in a K-12 school. I don't know about down here, but down south, almost every K-12 school built with cinder block. Okay, a five gigahertz signal is not going to go very well through cinder blocks, especially when they're painted and all that. It's just not going to go well through it. So maybe you'd want to put an access point in every room. Maybe you wouldn't want to put an access point in every room. Depends on coverage area and capacity. And you know, it doesn't say it up here, but building materials are vital. Okay, and this building, you know, it's a bunch of sheetrock. Okay. Can we go through sheetrock pretty easily? Yeah, we can. Now, what if it were plaster? Can we go through plaster that easily? Not as easily. We can certainly go through it, but not, not as well. So you want to make sure you get the building plan, sort of see how thick the walls are, see what their construction is, see where the insulation is, see what type of insulation. All this is important. Okay, device types. What types of access points are you going to put up? Are you going to put up enterprise ones at the you know, most basic level? Or are you going to put up high-end enterprise ones? You're not going to put up anything but an enterprise access point, but you know, certainly consider the device types. Okay, so you know what you typically would do is think about all that. Most of the vendors are going to have some sort of a coverage estimator, where you plug all those things in, you sort of give it a basic overview of the building, um, you give it the floor plan, tell it what their materials are. It's going to allow you to sort of test different access points without actually testing. Pretty cool stuff. Okay, so what you do is you figure out what access points are going to work well in your theoretical building. Go ahead and order them. Pre-deployment survey, you're picking locations for the access points. So you have the access points, you have a good idea of how many you would need to have based on these three criteria up here. And then you'd go out and you'd actually sort of, I wouldn't say jury-rig them together, but you're not going to permanently install them in this phase. Uh, different companies do this a little bit differently. I've seen some uh, contractors have little stands they put the access points on. That's kind of cool. Uh, basically what you're doing is you're just temporarily installing them to see to test the coverage, to test the bandwidth, to test the interference. And that's all done in the pre-deployment. Okay, post-deployment survey. So in between pre-deployment and post-deployment, what do we do? Well, we deploy it. We're either pre before it or we're post after it. Okay. The actual deployment is where we put them up. Okay. Then the post-deployment, all we're doing is we're just you know doing basic analysis from the vendor tools of if those are good locations or not. If you have a terrible located access point, it's possible you may want to uninstall it and move it. Okay? Now that's pretty rare because you should have covered that not only in the pre-deployment, but even in the pre-pre-deployment. Okay? But you know, make mistakes. It's very possible to do it. You know, if you're having thousands of access points you're installing, is it likely that one or two will be in a bad place? That's yeah, pretty likely. But if you're just doing a handful, is it likely that one or two will be in a bad place? Not as likely. So make sure you understand that. Okay, another big consideration is capacity. So we've got three different uh, sort of things here. And, you know, the first two are the same size. And in the first example here, what we have is we have access points that are uh, sort of, you know, bordering each other. And I don't really like this graphic that much because what's the problem with this? According to this, there's dead space like everywhere. Okay, that's not likely to happen in practice. Does that make sense? It's really unlikely to see dead spots like that. Um, you know, it's it's not going to be a great signal in the middle, but it'll certainly be a signal. Okay, so it's where you consider the space. So think about what the space. Like I said, just consider what it's made of, how big it is, all that sort of stuff. Uh, devices on it, and the bandwidth. If you have very high bandwidth requirements, then obviously you need more access points. If you have low bandwidth requirements, you get away with fewer access points. Um, now, overlapping APs could be a good thing to do, especially on the 5 gigahertz and 6 gigahertz, because what you're doing is, you know, right here, we have three different non-overlapping uh, channels. And that's not very many. Because you can see here, we don't want the yellows, we don't want the whites, we don't want the greens to overlap each other. Because then we face all kinds of problems. So yeah, I would almost say that for a corporate environment in 2021, just don't buy anything that supports 2.4 gigahertz. And just don't even turn it on. 
okay? Uh, that's a personal opinion. Maybe it's not a practical opinion, but, you know, I mean, if you're the IT department and it's a corporate environment, you do not control pretty much every device that the company buys. You do, okay? Why on earth would you be buying something that doesn't support two point, that doesn't support five gigahertz? I understand not buying something that supports six gigahertz. That's like new this year, basically, or new the past 12 months for the most part. But to buy something that doesn't support five gigahertz in 2020, I don't know why you would. So my advice would be to not only, you know, overlap, but just don't get 2.4 gigahertz devices. You know, buy stuff that supports five gigahertz. Don't even enable the 2.4 gigahertz radios. Does that make sense? That's a personal opinion. I think it'd be a lot better off if you know people wouldn't use 2.4 gigahertz. Okay, like I said, use whatever vendor-provided tools you have access to. Um, most of the time, you know, enterprise access points, you're going to have access to pretty robust uh, sort of modeler, like even the the Unify system. Even it comes with a pretty robust way to put a floor plan in, put different access points in, and see the coverage map. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close. Okay, that's going to be good enough for a wireless site survey. Pretty close. Okay, doesn't have to be 100%. Let's get it, you know, 95 plus percent. Okay. Uh, basically, like I said, if you've got multiple floors, it's even trickier. So, again, not really an issue with 5 gigahertz, though. Does that make sense? Because with these, you have three channels that don't overlap. With 5 gigahertz, you have like 20 plus channels that don't overlap. So. A little bit about wireless security, like I said, we'll be covering this in more detail uh, next class. But uh, just understand that a rogue access point is an access point that is on in the network that is not controlled by the network administration. So two ways to avoid it. Um, the book doesn't really talk about certificates for this, but I think it's the best way to avoid it. Because basically what you have is if you have the same SSID, okay, without a certificate in place, that's the only way that that network is verified. Okay, so use a certificate, okay, for your wireless network. If it doesn't match, then don't connect to it. Um, if it does match, then go ahead and connect to it. Really straightforward way to do so. It is a pain to manage, though, I'm not going to lie. Wireless controllers can also detect this and tell you where it is. And then, you know, if someone's breaking your company policies, you know, take it up with HR, but go remove the wireless access points that's not your wireless access point. Um, pretty self-explanatory there. Okay, ad hoc networks. Uh, basically what happens here is you have different networks in place, like we've talked about ad hoc before. That can be a problem because it's not managed by the corporate environment. So if you have a wireless access point, it could send the authentication frame to it. That's about the only thing you can do about it. Um, denial of service. So this is in the context of an access point, not like a website or anything. Basically, you have interference, most likely caused by purposeful jamming. Could be unpurposeful jamming. You know, if it's unpurposeful, you know, hopefully your access point will automatically change the channel. Um, if it's not, you know, if it is purposeful, find the jammer, okay? Your access points, you know, through the controller, they're going to tell you where it is. Pretty close. Um, and, you know, a lot of times, the further out you get from an access point, obviously, the less accurate that number is going to be. But it's going to tell you pretty much where it is. So, you know, go find it, you know, take HR with you if you need to, take police with you. I mean, don't get yourself killed or anything, but go find it and remove it, okay? Um, if it's something done purposefully. Okay, so flood guard, uh, going to be pretty self-explanatory. If you had a device that were sending a lot of unknown MAC addresses on purpose, then not really a whole lot you can do about it other than hopefully kick that device off the network. Um, but maybe it's not even connected to the network. That's certainly possible. Um, BPDU guard is going to prevent the switches from connecting to unauthorized switches. We talked about that in previous chapters. And then root guard, of course, we've got that as well. Okay, something new is RADIUS. So I think it stands for remote authentication and I don't remember exactly. <laughs> but basically, this is the IEEE 802.1x standard. And you have a corporate environment. You don't want to use a single password, okay, for the network, obviously. So let's say you have 100,000 people working for your company. Pretty much every day, someone's going to get fired. Okay, let's just be honest. 100,000 employees, someone's getting canned every day. Okay, and if they're not, 
someone is resigning every day, someone's getting a new job, someone's retiring. Uh, lots of reasons why people aren't with the organization anymore. But imagine if you had to change the password every single time. Well, you just disable the account, and the Radius server is tied into access, Active Directory or similar uh, if you have some other system. And basically, what this looks like is you have your 802.11 network, you have your access point here, and it's going to communicate with the Radius server to try to make sure that people are able to log in with their credentials. So it's going to use a username and password as opposed to using just the uh, you know, shared key. Okay, TKIP is going to be pretty much mostly outdated for 2021. Not going to go too much into it. Temporal key integrity protocol. And basically, this is an extension. It's almost like an extension of WEP. I really hesitate to say it's compatible with WEP because it's not necessarily. It's it's complicated. Don't worry about it too much. Like I said, this is stuff from like 2005. It's not really stuff from 2021 by any stretch. But basically, what happens is the TKIP is going to be sort of unique to the handshake. Okay, so you got your handshake happening here. It's going to be using 48-bit uh, for the TKIP sequence itself. And then the overall key is a total of 128 bit. So, you know, wire, wired equivalent uh, protocol, not great to use. There's no reason why you would use it unless you have completely legacy devices that only support it. And in that case, you know, just use a hardwired connection. I mean, goodness gracious. WEP is terrible. Does that make sense? Okay. It's slow. It's inefficient. It's not secure. Um, yeah, like I said, we're not going to cover this too much. We'll cover it more in a few chapters. Um, WPA and WPA2 uh, pre-shared key. Um, it's not big use WPA2 Enterprise. Enterprise, of course, is using Radius, but this is using a pre-shared key. And the key is going to be stored locally on the device. And this is going to be okay for home use. It's not going to be the best security in the world, obviously. But you would never, ever, ever use this in an enterprise environment. Okay, as soon as you start getting like more than five employees, Give everyone their own username and password, and have them use that. It'll be a lot more secure. It's going to have a lot of benefits to doing so. Okay. Uh, whoops. Got the same slide in there twice. Uh, certificates. So this is where we're talking about a public key infrastructure. Okay, we have asymmetric encryption. We have a different public key than the private key. And this is going to be supported by WPA2, specifically WPA2 Enterprise. Not every device supports that. It supports WPA2. But in any enterprise access point should support it. Okay, we have two main protocols to know for this. Extensible authentication protocol, it's gonna be certificate based. And we also have protected extensible authentication protocol. And it basically takes the EAP connection and it, it basically encrypts it within inside of a TLS tunnel. No real reason to use EAP over PEEP in 2021. Go ahead and encrypt it with PEEP. Okay. So, just to wrap everything up, we talked about wireless networking, talked about the 802.11 standards, talked about wireless network components, basic things with site surveys, and wireless security. Again, don't worry too much, we went really fast with wireless security. I know that. It's covered more in the next few chapters. Any questions before we wrap up? Anyone leave a chat comment or anything? All right, guys. Well, I appreciate you all joining, uh, be it virtually, be it in person, be it whatever. Have a great weekend. See you Monday.